First of all, if anybody is here for the first time, welcome. Uh, this is the Manchester Historical Museum's Spring Lecture Series. This is the last one of the season, but it doesn't mean we're done by any means. Um, we, uh, there is a little card at each door if you wish to see what we're still working on. It's on the second side. Um, on Saturday, May 21st is our next family program. It's held in conjunction with the library. It's Manchester Maritime Heritage Day. We will be singing sea chanties. We will be making little boats. We will be doing uh, Sailor Valentines and um, having lots of fun. So anybody with little peoples, please come join us. It is a free program, thanks to our wonderful sponsors to these events. Then on Wednesday, June 1st, supposedly here in this room, depending on the status of the floor, um, is our annual meeting with the dinner and uh, the annual meeting uh, vote in the slate of our um, board, annual report, and then a wonderful uh, program, the Natural History of Manchester, A Walk on the Wild side. And that is being presented by Chris Leahy from the Audubon Society. It will be wonderful. Um, that is um, a paid event. We have to pay for the food. So um, those, those announcements will be going in the mail this week. Watch for them probably the beginning of next week. And we do ask that you prepay for that event so we know how much to tell the caterer to make. Then um, on June 4th is the next family program Saturday, also held in conjunction with the library. It's part of the KPN Reads program, and it's a book walk. Now, from what I understand is you're gonna, there's gonna be parts of books in various places of Manchester, and you walk and read the books as you go. There's two different walks. We will be at Seaside One for one of the walks and showing off how we fought fires in the old days with the old equipment and making everybody do a bucket brigade. So please stop by and have fun with us. And then we end off this sp spring season with a huge bang. June 25th is our bath house bash. I had to say that slowly. <laughs> That is our fundraiser. If you don't know about our bathhouse, we are so excited. It's one of the original bathhouses from Singing Beach. We only know of six, although there's a possibility there's a seventh that somebody is going to trespass and see if it exists. Um, that is going to be live music, wonderful food. We've had all kinds of people stepping up with donations with wonderful um, drinks and food for that evening. We're going to have a silent and lot and a live auction, and we will be raising money to restore that uh, bathhouse, put it on a permanent foundation in the backyard, and if you've ever noticed our backyard, it's lumpy and a hill, we have to have some landscaping done. So that's actually the most expensive part of the project, is the landscaping, uh, but we are gonna be raising money to save our bathhouse. So you will be getting uh, notifications about that if you haven't already noticed some of the things going around. And I've been asked to give one more announcement, which sounds really fun. This Sunday, May 15th at 1.30, Nancy Coffey, remember our wonderful two talks about at your service, the servants and the, at the fancy houses along the coast? Nancy's right down here front. Wave, Nancy. She's going to be giving a history walk on West Beach about focusing on the beach mansions in the early part of the 20th century. Fits very well with those two previous talks. So if you're interested in joining her, it's free, um, and it's part of the Beverly Open Space Committee series. Did I get that right? Um, check in with Nancy afterwards. It's a wonderful option, um, opportunity. This Sunday, right? May 15th, 1.30. So again, check in with Nancy at the end of the program. Um, if you'd like to join her for that walk. Now I'm going to hand, I'm done with my part. It's John's uh, moment to shine. These lectures are his baby. He's the one who hunts out these speakers, these topics. And he does a fabulous job. And uh, we are so grateful that we have him. So I'm going to let him take over. <laughs> Golly, I feel so important. 
Our guest speaker this evening is a relatively new member of the museum, but has quickly made an impact both as a volunteer in the archives and as one of our several new members of the board. Following graduation from Smith College, Leslie Beatty moved to Dallas, where she got married and with her husband, Rob, raised three native Texans. There, Leslie earned a master's degree in information studies and in turn did research for an executive recruiting firm, wrote for a local paper, became a middle school librarian, and a fifth grade student advisor. Clearly, a lady of many interests and many talents. And oh yes, she is currently completing training as a docent at the Cape Ann Museum. As program chair for the museum, I am always on the lookout for potential speakers. And before Leslie knew what hit her, <laughs> I had her signed, sealed, and delivered. I'm sure you'll enjoy her well-researched look at the not-so-miserable Misery Islands. sure everything's on here and thank you John for a nice introduction and it is ironic that um, I'm speaking of can you hear me now is that, okay. there we go is that better a little bit closer Oh boy, I have to almost get it where it's in my mouth. <laughs> okay, is that better for everyone? Okay. Um, the irony being that here I have just moved from Texas not, well, not even a year ago, and I'm telling you all about the Misery Islands. That's the irony. So here we go. Um, with few exceptions, Islands of the state's North Shore, unlucky enough to stand in the way of the Atlantic swells, are inhospitable to all but the sea, seabirds and stray seals. Misery Island, with its 89 acres, and Little Misery, as well as Baker's Island, have a different story. The island's misery will pro probably had to do with shipwrecks of colonial times. Indeed, records show that there had been many wrecks on or near the miseries, and would continue to be, but it was not until early 1796, when the Brig John was lost in the vicinity during a snowstorm at night, that finally produced a lighthouse on Baker's Island two years later. From earliest descriptions, the island has always had that adjective attached to it, but there were times where it was referred to as Moulton's misery or Morton's misery, the confusion deriving perhaps to phonetic spelling or inaccurate hearing. The, consens the consensus favored Moulton. Records show that a Robert Moulton in 1629, a master ship carpenter sent over by London adventurers to supply watercraft and encourage shipbuilding, was a well-known and estimable man, while a Thomas Morton was asked to answer in Salem for his much insolence, profaneness, and loose carriage. In any event, the misery seemed to have shrugged off whatever other names to which they might have become attached. Before going much further, let's talk geography. This is probably how the islands might look from a tall ship. Let's see if I can get there. So the description, uh, uh, or maybe a very tall lighthouse. Uh, um, so the description that the Beverly Historical Society attached to this is keeping a respectful distance from West Beach while guarding the channel into Salem Harbor or Misery Island with little misery tagging along um, and Baker's Island, uh, the one right here. Um, the next one is um, a bird's eye view then, even or a plane's eye view maybe, um, of the Misery Islands and their surroundings. The islands are located at 42.5487 degrees north and 70.7981 degrees west. 
This comes from a page from the book Jeffrey's Creek by Gordon Abbott Jr., which brings us a surprise. I'll just read a part of it. Quote, for more than a hundred years, residents in Manchester have been told that John Winthrop's ship Arbella, bound for Salem from England in 1630, came to anchor at the end of her voyage in the waters of Manchester's outer harbor. Indeed, the Arbella's replica adorns the town seal. Another version espoused by Abbott indicates that the ship bypassed Manchester altogether and anchored west of the Misery Islands in Plum Bay off the Beverly Shore. Abbott refers to this picture to strengthen his argument. It also says, looking south from Great Misery, visitors see the single light at Baker's Island across Salem Channel. It was through this passage that the Arbella passed in 1630, leaving little misery to starboard as she ghosted into Salem Harbor. In whatever direction the Arbella sailed before landing in what is now Salem, it didn't change anything having to do with the Misery Islands themselves. Because the island is rough and gouged out by a shallow valley cradling a small pond, Salem leased it out for nothing better than pasturage as early as 1628. In 1631, Salem had taken possession of the two islands, which was authorized by an act passed by the Court of Assistance. Besides pasturage, people were using the island in search of ballast, fish flaking, fuel, and timber. This, no doubt, is a familiar picture, especially to those having grown up in this area. In 1638, there was a deed of half and possibly the whole of the Misery Islands from Chief Maskinamata of Agawam to John Winthrop, Jr., who then proceeded to convey to the extent of 40 acres to Bartholomew Gales without regard to the act passed by the Salem's Court of Assistance. 28 years later, an Indian deed was signed in Salem claiming ownership of the other part of Misery Island. In an attempt to end any further strife, Salem decided to lease the islands to a man of influence, thus enlisting a private interest as well as a public authority for the island's protection. The first lessee then was Captain George Corwin, who built a costly and elegant pleasure house there. Earlier, in 1636 in England, when he was 26 years old, Captain George Corwin married Elizabeth Herbert White. The two of them, along with their two children, came to Salem under the auspices of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Corwin became a, a wealthy merchant there, acquiring large tracts of land and taking a lively interest in local and military affairs. He was active in the First Church of Salem, served by Roger Williams. He and his, wife, his first wife went on to have a total of seven children together, and after she died in 1668, he married a year later the only daughter of Governor Edward Winslow and herself the widow of Robert Brooks. Three more children were born to this marriage. When Corwin died in 1685, he was one of the wealthiest and most aristocratic men in New England and left the largest state, 5,964 pounds and 10 shillings to be exact, including what you see on the slide, a silver lace cloth coat, a velvet ditto, a satin waistcoat embroidered with gold, a trooping scarf and a silver hat hand, golden topped and embroidered, and a silver headed cane. Benjamin Marston succeeded Captain Corwin as lessee upon the latter's death. While Marston was residing on the island, he unluckily brought smallpox onto it after he, his crew, and his boat Sterling returned from a trip to the Barbados. They were detained and quarantined on the island until the danger of their contamination passed. And town records of July 10th and August 16th show that some of his crew did indeed die, die there from the outbreak. Because Marston emerged as an outspoken loyalist, 
he fled to Boston after his house was attacked by a Patriot mob. His wife, left to watch the property, died soon afterwards. Marston accompanied the British garrison of Boston to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where he was to have a checkered career as a merchant and supercargo, mainly in the West Indian trade. He was captured three times by American privateers, but was exchanged each time. In 1781, on a voyage from Annapolis Royal to Halifax, his ship was blown off course and trapped in ice near Cape Canso. It was almost three months before Marston reached Halifax again. There he lived in poverty until 1783, when he was appointed surveyor of the new Loyalist settlement of Port Roseway, now Shelburne. For the next 15 months, Marston carried on a difficult task, exacerbated by what he called this cursed Republican town meeting spirit of the disputatious <laughs> refugees. A year later, he was forced to flee again when riots occurred and he was, perhaps unjustly, accused of partiality in the surveying and distributing of land there. Soon afterwards, on the recommendation of his cousin Edward Winslow, Marston was appointed by the Surveyor General of the King's Woods in North America, John Wentworth, to be his deputy in the newly created province of New Brunswick. In 1787, Marston went, Marston went to Boston and, and obtained documentation to aid the Winslow family's claim as loyalists for compensation from the British government. Late that summer, he left to press his own claim, where, sometimes close to starvation in London, he eked out a living for four years. To his great disappointment, he was awarded only 105 pounds, less than a quarter of his claim, and sufficient only to pay his own debts. In 1792, he accepted a position as surveyor for a private company intending to settle Balama, a West African island. Most of the colonists, including Marston, died of fever shortly after arrival. Subsequently, this listing appeared in the Essex Gazette. I'm gonna read this to you only because it's a little bit hard. And it says, quote, to be sold, the islands called the Great and Little Misery, lying in Salem Harbor, being part of the estate of Benjamin Marston Esquire, late of Manchester, deceased. Said islands are well accommodated with a good dwelling house and barn, a good well, a pond of water, which waters four divisions of pasture. The whole is divided into six divisions by a good stone wall, the buildings and fences are in good condition. Any person minding to purchase the premises may apply to Benjamin Marston, Esquire of Marblehead, executor to the will of the deceased aforementioned, who will sell the same at a reasonable price and on easy terms of payment." Close quote. Back to what was occurring between America and England. At the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, the North Shore was patrolled below Tuck's Point by details from Glover's regiment, two British coasters sailing from Boston and driven by stress of weather, took refuge under the lee of Misery Island, where they were soon discovered and reported. This was on November 4, 1775. One of the ships escaped, but the other, a sloop commanded by British Captain Ritchie, and laden with goods and provisions for the ministerial army in Nova Scotia, was captured by a detail from Captain Moses Brown's Beverly Company of Glover's Regiment. It is said that Captain Brown went on to become conspicuous as a citizen patriot and a member of the legislature of Massachusetts. Moving on, the island sat without an inhabitant for five plus years, after which the Dodge family, through a series of conveyances, came into possession of it. The farmhouse they built there passed into the hands of Daniel Neville in 1844, though some records show it's in 1849. The deed granted to him made him the owner of a considerable tract of land, nine times the area of Salem Commons, lying within a mile of shore near a ready market between Boston Harbor and the Isle of Shoals. 
Neville, an Irish immigrant, also described, though, as a penniless adventurer, had made his living quarrying stone from the Boston Harbor Islands. He married and his family grew up on the miseries. According to the Salem historian Robert Rantoul, Neville welcomed all comers, including Salmon P. Chase, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the time, who arrived with his friend, the State Treasurer, General Henry K. Oliver, for a chowder party on the island. A more recent chronicler of the miseries, Red Harwood, describes it differently. A descendant of the Nevilles reported that much time was spent chasing off the less distinguished from the Nevilles' domain. <laughs> While the Nevilles still inhabited the island, however, they had the misfortune of having a great plague of grasshoppers land, consume, destroy crops, and generally overtake the island. The following year, un undeterred, Neville bought up a flock of turkeys, which ensured the grasshoppers' disappearance. <laughs> Ten years later, after, ne um, after Neville's death, the family farmhouse burned down. Sometime between 1882 and 1884, the Misery Islands title passed to the Common Sense Fertilizer Company. Keep that name in mind. <laughs> mind you, there had been plenty of sheep and cattle living on the island throughout the island's history, and even when the animals didn't live there outright, the young ones were brought there by boat in the spring and towed at low tide back to the mainland when they were good and grown about six or seven months later. While the company was acquiring all the necessary permissions, it had plans to build a wharf, a dam, and other structures there, and to establish a bone boiling and rendering works, a Colonel Frank Haven of West Beach purchased it. His purpose for doing so was to set up a location for out-of-door sports, for exercise and diversion, and to provide every means of entertainment for yachtsmen and others. This would be a precursor to what was to become quite a popular vacation venue. In 1900, Great Misery was sold for 10 times its valuation to a Newton man who then sold it to a group of speculators. Under the banner of Charles Stedman Hanks and Thomas W. Pierce, the Misery Island Syndicate was born for a not so meager mortgage of $100,000. Hanks became the president, with Jacob Rogers and David Little be being named treasurer and secretary, respectively. Those three, along with Thomas Pierce, George Lee, George Weld, and Gordon Prince, became the first members of the board of directors. Membership fees were $25 each upon admittance into the club, and annual dues the same. Family memberships were double that. The North Shore Select were invited to join, and in fact, they did. Fifteen individuals and families from Manchester alone <laughs> became members right away. Uh, this is the club pennant, which features a seahorse and an anchor against a white background with red and green borders, the club colors. So, do you like the, the new um, the new name for the miseries, Mystery Island, always cool, 42 minutes from Boston, five minutes ferry trip from Beverly Farms, Manchester, Mass. So it's now Mystery Island and not misery. Um, but let me read this too, so you can hear what it is that they were advertising. From the island, one has a magnificent panorama of the North Shore for 20 miles in every direction with an atmosphere like the coast of Maine, yet within 19 miles of Boston. The island has about 80 acres with several beaches and one of the finest swimming pools in Massachusetts, which tempers the ocean water about 15 degrees. Very fine tennis courts are maintained by the casino where home-like rooms and board may be obtained. This property is being developed into beautiful summer homes and is one of the most attractive summer colonies in New England. One housekeeping cottage to rent for the summer or meals can be had at the casino. The new annex with small or large suites in connection with the casino will be ready for occupancy August 3rd. 
apply to John R. Griffin Manager or J.C. Rogers. So, a pair of NAFTA launches were purchased for the purpose of ferrying members from West Beach to the island and back. From West Beach, it was an easy walk to the Beverly Farms train station where the family breadwinners could ride into the city and back each day while their families enjoyed island life for part of the summer. And just as advertised, a portion of the island's cove was dammed to make a saltwater swimming pool. A custom house was erected at the end of the pier on the west shore of the island. An existing cottage was converted into a boathouse. A well was dug and a water tower was raised. Guest houses, the castle, the governor's palace, and servants' quarters were also built. From the west shore of the cove, a clubhouse rose, then a trap shooting range, along with the tennis court. An old boathouse was converted into a caddy house and a locker room, and a nine-hole golf, golf course was squeezed onto the old Neville pastures. Lastly, another old cottage was rolled down to the cove to be transformed into the Misery Island Station of the Manchester Yacht Club, and a regatta committee was duly appointed. A small hotel called the Casino, as well as five to six houses, were built for rent to families. An annex was also planned to accommodate an overflow of guests, though this structure was neither completed nor occupied. There was also an engine that pumped water from the well to a large tank, and an ice house where large blocks of ice cut from a nearby pond were stored. The only vehicle on the island belonged to the caretaker, but distances were short and paths across the meadows were easy to follow. Kerosene lamps, not electricity, lit the houses, and coal was used in the kitchen ranges. Heavy equipment and firewood were brought to the island on a small scow, towed by the caretaker's boat. Fresh foods were ordered by phone and delivered to the landings at West Beach and Manchester for pickup. The next several slides are what you'd recognize as a member of the Misery Island Syndicate. Here you see a clubhouse, a caddy house, and the th third putting green. Um, here you see, okay, um, let's see. Hold on one second. Um, bah, okay, back again. Um, there we go. There we have an example of a home built on the island. It looks like it was made for J.C. Hollander. And here's a better picture. And um, here you are looking at members relaxing on the East Piazza of the clubhouse. And this is called the Loggia, filled with indoor games and comfortable um, gathering spots, especially when the weather wasn't all that clement. Here is a harbor showing the club launch, caddy house and clubhouse. And this is actually a depiction of Misery Island looking from West Beach, showing several of the buildings belonging to the syndicate as you look towards Misery Island. You see those humps, whatever those buildings are. Here's another view of the harbor, along with various houses and the saltwater pool, which was right there. Um, OK, the bathing beach and the bathhouse. And this is called the custom house and the telephone office from which to place the grocery orders. And this is a, um, the cottage connected with the shooting range, which you'll soon see. And here's the old farm barns and the new water tower. And um, um, this is... Uh, okay, I'm not sure. This is, um, bah, okay, skip. <laughs> okay, actually, this looks like people are threshing and harvesting, but actually what they're doing is they're playing golf and they're playing. <laughs> it's just that the grass needs mowing. <laughs> okay, here we have the shooting range, and I, we have to admire the form of this, of this young lady. I mean, impeccable. Okay. 
So we'll leave it there for just a second. And the speed of the island's transformation was only exceeded by its dazzle. The first Invitational Golf Tournament was held at the end of June 1900, and 30 boats competed in the club's first three-day three event a month later. Club, club membership continued to grow, as did financial concerns. The first group of investors went bankrupt, and another group operated the club and sold house lots until 1917. They failed too, and sold to a third group, which also went bankrupt. The city of Salem auctioned off the club twice while the banks were closed and sold the island for a mere $5,000. Rumors that certain creditors wanted to buy the island and make it another Revere Beach caused quite a fuss to the nearby towns. Though the neighbors didn't like Senator Winthrop Crane's idea any better, which was to construct a natural leper hospital there. <laughs> Some of the island's acreage was indeed sold, though there were still plenty of vacationers who liked to gather in the cottages remaining on the island. In 1926, Everything, the casino, the cottages, the barn, the water tower, and one of the private houses burned to the ground when a brush fire blew out of control. One of the cottages that was not burned, however, was moved by Joseph Henderson to Marblehead. He had had the house cut in half to better transport, transport it to its new location, and once it was moved, he had the two pieces rejoined. In 1935, a Beverly oil dealer wanted to erect storage tanks to house 12 million gallons of oil on the island. The Salem City Council turned him down once the residents heard about the idea. From, from that concern came a group of citizens who raised $15,000 to buy most of the island, which was then given to the trustees of reservations for protection. However, that protection was threatened again in the 1970s when Salem eyed a remaining tract for use as a secondary sewage treatment plant. In the next decade, yet another piece of the island was put on the market for development, though again, money was raised, this time $120,000 in less than three months, to add to the trustees' holdings. The trustees now give tours from June to August and a visit to the island includes a history similar to one that I've just recounted. Ruins of the Mystery Island Syndicate can still be seen, as well as those of the steamship city of Rockland, which was scuttled there. Here, I've included a copy of the trustees map of Misery Islands. And um, at this point, the Misery Islands have accepted their fate. The golf course has returned to nature. The ocean has reclaimed the swimming pool. The crabgrass has overtaken the tennis court. And rabbits have a run of the place. However, I challenge you to visit the Miseries if you haven't already, via boat, dinghy, kayak, canoe, sail, or motorboat will do. And see for yourself that these islands aren't at all miserable anymore. Just ask any bird or rodent or even a picnicker. They'll tell you. Thank you. Are there any, any questions for Leslie? Yes, sir. Um, I remember as a child where it says Salem Sound uh, that looks towards Salem. Uh -huh. uh, there was a an airline, I mean an airplane hangar there. there you, I and, read uh, about that. I can remember going out with my brothers, and we stayed overnight. And uh, there were a bunch of uh, kids that uh, there were still some homes on that Salem Sound side. And I can remember uh, my brothers and I uh, walked up, and we could hear kind of like a party, and the kids were kicking the um, the front balustrades of the. Uh, what was left of the front porch and setting them on fire for a little campfire. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I've been all through that island and uh, uh, the water tower, uh, things are still there. The, the uh, piers that uh, held the porch for the uh, casino is still there. 
Chicago. It's uh, really quite an interesting place. So, okay. But when you grew up in the 50s, and that was a big trek for us from Marblehead to, uh, to go out there, uh, some of the homes were still there, and you could really uh, get a sense of what it must have been like. And it looks like it was really pretty, very, well, very comfortable. Yeah. For, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, in the course of doing Beverly Farms history, I've come across several things about Misery Island. What the first was, um, I did a lot of work on the Italian immigrants who came to Beverly Farms, and in 1900, I, I was looking for a particular person, and I found him in the census in Salem. And when I hit the census page, it had this huge group of Italians, Italian men in the 1900 census, and it was Misery Island. Mm -hmm. And they were bu building, I think they were probably building the casino. Oh. And it was a work camp out there. Um, and at one point, when the um, Misery I one of the many Misery Island groups failed, Daniel Linehan, who was a major contractor in Beverly Farms, wanted to turn Misery Island into a work camp for the Italians. So they wouldn't have to have those stinky Italians oh living in, in the shanty towns okay. where they were living in Beverly Farms and wow. other places. But rather to have the shanty town on Misery Island and bring them in every day. Good night. I'd miss that. To My work. goodness. Um, I think I, I think that little bit was in Joe Garland. Yeah, I can't hear you. Uh, I think that okay. little bit was in Joe Garland. Do you want to? Do you want to? I haven't discovered that. Do you want to? Oh, I can. Um, and the other story I've heard from the Conleys is that the fire on Misery Island was caused by Stephen Conley, who had a, con had a cottage out there and was burning leaves. And he managed to burn down the whole island. <laughs> um, oh, and the, the other one is the airport you spoke of. Um, I think was the original airstrip was built by Godfrey Cabot, who had a summer home in Beverly Farms and was an early... Um, uh, aeronautical person, and before and during World War I, he had, um, was doing experimental work out there with um, seaplanes. And so from Beverly Farms, from West Beach, you could see his um, seaplane operation going on during the, uh, during the war. Yeah. So, it, anyway. It was on an airport that was there, was a, um, a hangar. Uh -huh. and it had railings, and he used to fly a seaplane. And the, the uh, railings had a platform that went down into the water, and he would come up and ah, place okay. the plane, and then it had a cradle on it, and it would come in, and then they'd roll the entire thing into the, uh, into the hangar. And it was right up on the point that used to be a private, there was only one part of uh, Misery Island that was owned privately up until just a few years ago. Uh, by one of the Harringtons, Mike Harrington's brother Peter owned it. Huh. And Peter died of a massive heart attack at 45, and his estate sold that um, point, which is way up on the north northwest corner, uh, back to uh, to the um, trustees. yeah the trustees, and now they own the whole island. Yeah. But uh, that little airport, you know, when you were a kid and you yeah. had two old, older brothers, it was kind of <laughs> no, interesting. No. They were more adventurous than I was. <laughs> but I, I remember all those things, and it was really quite uh, quite an amazing place to visit as a child. Anyway, <laughs> it's an interesting place. Just a couple more questions. Sure. Two quick questions. One, um, how many private homes were uh, existed on Misery? You don't know. Yeah. And the other. The other is the casino was the name of the hotel. Is that correct? It wasn't actually a casino. I I think the casino and the hotel kind of went back and forth in terms of the name. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get this back on again. Okay, I think the hotel and the casino went back and forth in terms of their name. So depending on which group and who was using it, sometimes they'd refer to it as a casino and sometimes it was the hotel. But it, but it was never a gambling establishment. Okay, that's yeah. what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yes, yes ma'am. Um, my name is Betsy Ware and I grew up in Manchester on Walker Road. Go back in Newburyport now. And um, as a child, I remember the Manchester Harbor Boat Club used to do picnics in between Little Misery and Big Misery. 
And then um, my biology teacher when I was in high school, David Ryan, um, when the trustees first got the property, he was out there on a regular basis cleaning the island. And I remember him describing in class all the rats on the island. <laughs> My understanding is that there were technically 11 misery, 13 misery islands. Wow, and I so hadn't I'm read about that. I'm in your research if you've come up with any of those miseries. Wow, okay, see, I, I would call that a mystery, not a misery, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how fun for you to have had David Ryan as a biology oh, teacher, fabulous. and evidently he was amazing as yeah. a tour guide too yeah. for the island. Yeah. Um, I spoke with his his widow, uh, and the, or the widow, and, and she was just telling me on and on how much he adored that job. Yeah, he absolutely did. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, in regard to the uh, interest in aviation in this area in general, which is not very well known, uh, the first takeoff of an airplane in New England was off the frozen Lake Chebacco in Essex in 1910 on the ice and, uh, from the ice. And that was an associate of Cabot's who was uh, um, who uh, not Burgess. 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 Was an associate of Burgess's who that plane flew in the middle of April. They flew once. They packed it up. They knew it would fly. And they sent it to Missouri where it never flew again because it got broken. <laughs> and and um, he went on six months later. He went to an air show in Swanner, Massachusetts. In Quincy, where he demonstrated his planes, and he sold seven of them to a British aviator, and they were the first planes that were exported from North America to Europe. Very fun. Okay, one, 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 last, one last question. I wanted to know more about the pasturage. That was the first usage of, of the island, and I was so, I mean, originally I thought of uh, the swimming lessons for the cows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I okay, I see where you're going with this. They took the calves, cows. Right, exactly. Yeah. And then the tide was low enough in the, at the end of the season that they could bring Well, they timed it in such a way that they that at this point the calves were much bigger than they have been. And um, they didn't have to go in the in the scows or the in the boats anymore that they could they could make it there across whatever expanse of, it, w it wasn't very long, and low tide, you could almost maybe swim, not too far, but um, at any rate, there were lots of coming goings, and, and I love, again, that the name of that common sense fertilizer company, it just makes sense for them to have had an interest in that island. Okay, one last one. Um, if you take a look at up there on the right side, the top right, it says a sense of place. See the first dot where it says A? Mm -hmm. um, the men in 1926 were cleaning the, uh, the island to get it ready for the summer. And it was tradition that uh, there's a cliff there. And it was tradition that they used to take all of the hay and, uh, and droppings and so on uh, and throw them over the cliff. and. Uh, when they did that, they set it on fire, and the fire was always, you know, a safe place to be. But that particular day that they did that, uh, the, it was a big mound of uh, of refuge, and um, uh, they set it on fire, and a squall happened, and the wind. They always waited for a southwest wind, and so that the the uh, embers would go out, and it turned around and came in northeast. And it blew some embers, and it got the uh, island got caught on fire up by that A, 
uh, where that cliff is. And it just went, uh, with a northeast wind, it just went right across the island. So that's where a lot of the homes were lost. Yeah. It mm -hmm. wasn't anything that, were, you know, like Stephen Conley was, uh, um, huh. you know, just doing his own thing there. They had a tradition where they would go out and they'd clean the island before everybody got out there for the summer. So it was a huge brush fire. Okay. But it started in that, off that cliff. Yeah, but there was just enough wind in that squall that it, it turned. And before the guys we had a chance to fight it, uh, the embers were just going yeah. on. And uh, it was right. like that fire up in uh, Canada right now. It just mm -hmm. devastated that island. OK, I think we ought to give Leslie a big yeah. hand for yeah. <laughs> Um, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you at the annual meeting. We'll look forward to seeing you then a few weeks later at the uh, bathhouse bash. Uh, and as we traditionally do, as we disperse, if you could all help fold your... The chairs came off the stage today because of the So do we just leave them here? No, we need to bring them the stage. Okay, if you could just bring your chairs forward, apparently. And we must have a stage committee. <laughs> Need leave 30 of them set up. So, okay, figure that out, folks, and thanks for coming. <laughs>